speaking to lawmakers. George Floyd's brother is on Capitol Hill today after attending his brother's funeral yesterday. We have his testimony. Global pandemic, an update on the coronavirus crisis as numbers start to rise again. A new home. We are learning more about the Chinese Catholic journalist who broke with communist censors to broadcast about the Tiananmen Square massacre. And wrestling with God. Pope Francis draws an unusual analogy for praying. We'll explain. On EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, June 10th, 2020. Good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. President Donald Trump slams what he calls a radical left agenda to defund police departments. Congress is looking to reform policing in the wake of George Floyd's death. At the same time, the White House press secretary answered our question about protests being allowed, but not large church gatherings. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports now. Owen. Tracy, here at the White House, I asked Press Secretary Kelly McEnany if President Trump thinks it's a double standard if all those protesters can be out there exercising their constitutional right, yet church gatherings are extremely restricted. He absolutely sees an issue. There have been several cases pointed to where people attending church in their cars were targeted by law enforcement officers. Um, so that that's unacceptable. You know, people should be allowed to worship. We have a First Amendment in this country. There's a way to safely do it. And Press Secretary Kelly McEnany on White House plans to revamp and rework policing without gutting it. But this president knows fundamentally that most police officers in this country are good. As for calls to defund and disband, earlier today, President Donald Trump tweeted, this radical left agenda is not going to happen. Many, like Minneapolis, want to close their police departments. Crazy. Uh, Chokeholds are strictly prohibited. In Denver, the police chief there believes the tipping point, as he calls it, has been reached. Uh, we need to truly re-examine, uh, we have to reevaluate and really reimagine what public safety looks like now and what it's going to look like in the future. In Seattle, demonstrators packed City Hall Tuesday night. A protest against police tactics, even calls for the mayor to resign, and one council member calling for defunding the police. There's room for improvement, and we know that. Earlier this week, the president held a law enforcement roundtable at the White House. We're happy to be at the table. We're happy to welcome uh, that input and do what we can uh, to be better. Better police in this country, better police for our citizens and our communities. And near the White House, after weeks of protests, some violent, demanding police reform, an end to racism, and justice for George Floyd. Today, workers spotted removing concrete barriers. I stood in line for three hours. Meanwhile, on a separate front in Georgia, a messy primary, hours-long lines, voting machine malfunctions, provisional ballot shortages, and November isn't that far off. Finally, in an op-ed, Joe Biden says he supports police reform but not defunding police. Tracy. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reporting for us tonight. Thank you so much, Owen. Alvilani Floyd, the brother of George Floyd, testified today before the House Judiciary Committee in a hearing on police reform. As we have reported, George Floyd's death last month while in police custody has sparked nationwide and global protest. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales was inside the hearing and joins us now. Eric? Well, Tracy, Democrat committee members tell EWTN that today's hearing was to take a closer look at racial profiling, police brutality, and the lack of trust of police departments. But yet, members of both parties say it's also a time to remind the public that not, not all police officers are bad, and majority of them are out there protecting communities. George called for help, and he was ignored. Please listen to the call I'm making to you now to the cause of our family 
and the calls ringing out the streets across the world. One day after the funeral of George Floyd, his younger brother joined civil rights and law enforcement leaders testifying before the House Judiciary Committee. When we interact with police, we all want to be treated with respect, not suspicion. Nobody should be subjected to harassment or excessive force just because of the color of their skin, and no one should suffer the indignities of racial profiling or be on the end of a deadly chokehold. The committee is considering the proposed Justice and Policing Act, which aims to prevent future police misconduct. Reforms must focus around three core concepts to simplify it, transparency, training, and termination of those rare bad apples in law enforcement who violate the law and the legitimacy that upholds the character of our legal system. One witness for the Democrats says Congress has to make a powerful statement. But reforming policing is going to also take action at the local level. The National Association of Police Organizations represents more than 240,000 officers nationwide. Their executive director tells me if lawmakers create a national registry of police misconduct, it must be reliable. I think both all sides would want that, that there's some sort of registry that we're putting officers' names on that, saying that they, they should not be an officer, they should not be rehired. We want to have some confidence in that if it's going to mean anything. Bill Johnson says that the data collected should include such items as, was the investigation real? Was it uh, complete? And also, did um, it end up uh, costing anybody any, any anything else. and uh, But he also says that today's was a real opportunity to be able to provide some real change, some positive change. Tracy. Okay, thank you, Eric. Corresponding Eric Grisales reporting from Capitol Hill. Thank you again. And coming up later in the show, analysis on policing in the United States from Chuck Wexler, the head of the Police Executive Research Forum. In Rome, dozens of young Catholics held a vigil for George Floyd last night. They prayed for a peaceful coexistence in St. Bartholomew Church on an island in the Tiber River. And outside, they held candles and kneeled. They called for an end to racism, social discrimination and violence. It was organized by the group Young People for Peace, which has close relations with the Vatican. Some countries are gradually trying to reopen sectors of their economy, while others report record numbers and a nearing spike in coronavirus cases. From India to Mexico and Yemen, the fallout from COVID-19 continues. Correspondent Mark Irons reports. While people in London are returning to work and taking public transportation, the number of COVID-related deaths in the UK now tops more than 50,000. That puts the UK second to the US, which has the highest number of deaths in the world, with over 112,000. Still, the UK business secretary says the government aims to reopen more parts of the economy in July. In the meantime, we will continue to protect livelihoods and support businesses so that they're ready to bounce back and play their part in the economic recovery. Spain is gradually reopening, but wearing a face mask is mandatory. And without one, you could be fined up to 100 euros. Brazil has seen a huge spike in reported cases, and Russia has been one of the hardest hit countries, but its handling of the crisis has faced scrutiny, following the low number of reported deaths despite the high number of cases. The Kremlin's spokesman defends the response. Well, actually, uh, nothing has uh, went wrong except the coronavirus itself. India's worst-hit state has over 85,000 cases of coronavirus. That's more than the number of cases reported out of China. And there are over 124,000 confirmed virus cases in Mexico. The World Health Organization warns the country could be nearing its peak. In Yemen, a country battered by civil war and food shortages, experts fear the situation could get even tougher as the country deals with a growing outbreak of coronavirus. The virus is likely to spread faster, more widely, and with deadlier consequences in Yemen than almost anywhere else. There's no question that there are hundreds, probably thousands, maybe even now tens of thousands of people who have been impacted by COVID. In Washington, Mark Irons, EWTN News Nightly. A charity founded by a British billionaire gives over $1 million to the Catholic Church to fight poverty caused by the coronavirus pandemic. The money was donated by the Albert Goubet Charitable Foundation. Goubet, who died in 2016, made a pact with God when he was young that if he would ever to become rich, he would give half of his money to the church.
Pope Francis is starting a fund with over a million dollars to help people in the Diocese of Rome who are having difficulty putting food on the table during this pandemic. The Holy Father calls it the Jesus the Div Divine Worker Fund, and it will help people who lost work because of the lockdowns. The Vatican's provisional deal with China over the appointment of bishops is set to expire in September. One of the accord's chief negotiators says it should be renewed for one or two more years. Archbishop Claudio Maria Celle adds the Holy See has not made any decision on any possible extensions. For more on this story, including a look at the history of negotiations between the Vatican and China's communist government, visit our partners at catholicnewsagency.com. A Chinese journalist fired for broadcasting a program marking the sixth anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre has been given refugee status in Italy. On June 4, 1995, Delu aired a radio program on the massacre. He says that he was fired on the spot and forced to offer official apologies. In addition, his movements were regularly monitored by the Chinese communist regime. The 56-year-old later converted to Catholicism. He was given re refuge in Italy thanks to the help of a lawyer, Luca Antianetti. Luca, Deleuze legal manager, joins us now from Rome. Luca, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks to you. Luca, I know Delu says that he wants to speak publicly about the Chinese communist regime's efforts to in intimidate the media. What is he alleging? The story and the living legend of Dalu is very interesting because really Dalu he was the first man who made public the Tiananmen Square massacre. He did this in his uh, radio broadcast in uh, 4th June uh, um, 1995, uh, the sixth anniversary of the massacre. Uh, that was his last broadcast, because he was uh, fired on the spot, and the broadcast was cancelled in the program. So this is a unique story. Dalu is a living legend, because he survived to the persecution of the CCP, Communist Chinese Party, for 25 years, and today is safe and sound in Italy. Luca, why did you decide to help him? Yes, I decided to offer him not only legal assistance, but more uh, human, uh, human hospitality, because Dalu be become a man of family. Uh, you should know that Dalu is now Catholic, too, so this is very, a very strong uh, story in that moment. And we, we have to decide, decide on which part, in which side of the history we have to stay, and uh, we decide to stay with the weeks, so like uh, Dalu and all the brothers and sisters persecuted in China. Um, why did Dalu decide to become Catholic? And also, can you talk about the church in China? The Church in China is living a very difficult and hard moment. Dalu decided to uh, come to Italy because it, his was uh, like a, home, a spiritual homecoming, because he's, uh, he's become, he's, he became Catholic only in 2010. He received the baptism uh, with the Catholic Church, but it's very difficult now, the situation, because the regime and the dictatorship is is uh, very oppressive and is a blood, bloody regime. So now we have to fight again, because it's not Dalu uh, a peculiar case, but this is very spread in the Catholic community. What I can do now is that take care of Dalu, that is safe and sound, and uh, going on to help Chinese brothers and sisters. I know you just mentioned that Delu is safe and sound. I know he is with you and your family. What about his family in China? How are they doing right now? 
uh, this is a very d difficult moment for them because we our case is monitored by Amnesty International London the secre the general secretariat in London so for us it's a very hard moment and also we are uh, very scared for uh, our own lives because uh, we know that the communist Chinese party is not so happy to have a uh, uh, people like Dalu that is a living legend that is safe and in the same time uh, they don't like the story of faith, hope, courage, dignity that Dalu is uh, is the protagonist of this story, and he's writing also a book for telling the persecution of this terrible regime. Well, Luca, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it, and we also really appreciate you sharing Dalu's story with us. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you. Coming up, analysis of why police training should include respecting the sanctity of life. As we've been reporting, policing and the training of police officers here in the U.S. are receiving renewed attention in the wake of George Floyd's death. Tonight, we take a closer look at what reform could look like and best practices going forward. Joining me now on Skype to talk more about that is Chuck Wexler, executive director of the Police Executive Research Forum, an independent research and policy organization. Chuck, welcome to the show. Good to have you on. Thank you for having me. Chuck, you put out a report back in 2016 that outlined 30 guiding principles on the use of force for police departments. In it, you say the sanctity of human life should be at the heart of everything an agency does. Can you tell me more about that as a foundation? Well, that, you know, that was very important to us back then as we thought about the issues we were confronting. What, what, what is policing all about? What is the most important thing for a police officer to remember in every encounter? And that was the sanctity of human life. That is why police exist. Their job is to protect other people's lives, to put them, the other people before them, and to serve people in a way that is humane. Uh, you know, in, when I worked in Northern Ireland, they refer to it as human rights. We believe the sanctity of human life is everything uh, it's very important for police officers to think of. Part of this also is to remind them, you know, that in certain situations, you might you you have to be prepared to put other people's lives before your own. So, um, and and that was important too because I remember being in um, uh, I think it was Scotland, and someone said to me, we had a police officer from the United States over, said the most important thing is for police officers to go home safely at night. That's what we would say. And I remember someone saying to me, why do you say that? And I said, well, we want police officers to go home safely. And they said, you know, what we would say is that the most important thing is for everybody to go home safely. So that was really crystallized in our minds. So we thought stating that as the first principle was very important to, to remind people, to remind the police, community, everybody, sanctity, human life, that's why we exist. Yeah, and Chuck, I know you also highlight other officers' duties to intervene. Um, what role can that play in stopping cases of excessive force? Well, that's really important. That was why it's uh, one of the top principles, the duty to intervene. And that principle actually came out 30 years ago in the Rodney King incident. Rodney King was beaten by Los Angeles police officers, you know, significant amount of time. It was a, a video, maybe one of the first viral videos. When people would look at that incident, they would certainly hold the officers responsible. But the other question they had from a management standpoint is there was a sergeant there. And they thought, what was that sergeant thinking? Why didn't he intervene? There are always going to be. So that was the takeaway, that duty to intervene, the responsibility that if something happens and you don't agree, you have a, 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 an official responsibility and a moral responsibility to step in. And if you look at the Rodney King incident and you look at the incident in Minneapolis, both of those incidents could have been averted if someone had said, whoa, stop, wait. That's, I mean, you would have saved the life in Minneapolis. You would have saved careers in Los Angeles. So the win-win the situation is you're always going to have, in any institution, you're going to have people that make mistakes. The question is, can you have other people get involved, step in, and say, hey, stop that? 
Well, Chuck, I really wish we had more time to talk, but I thank you for the time that you gave me. Uh, Chuck Wexler, Executive Director of the Police Executive Research Forum. Thank you again for your insights. Thank you. Up next, encouraging news for pro-lifers in the United Kingdom. And Pope Francis says prayer is a battle. We'll explain. Pope Francis has appointed a new bishop for St. Louis, Missouri. 61-year-old Bishop Mitchell Rosinski is currently the bishop of Springfield, Massachusetts. He grew up in Baltimore and went to seminary at Catholic University. When he takes over as Archbishop of the Diocese of St. Louis, he will oversee the largest city in Missouri with over a half a million Catholics. A stand for pro-life in Northern Ireland after last week's vote by the Assembly there in favor of a motion rejecting the imposition of abortion legislation by the Westminster Parliament. Welcoming the vote, the Catholic Bishops' Conference of England and Wales responded, whilst this vote will not directly change the law in Northern Ireland, it does send a strong message that this decision should be made in Northern Ireland, not in Westminster. Catherine Hadro, host of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, joins me now to talk more about this. Catherine, welcome back to the show. So good to have you here. Thanks, Tracy. So, Catherine, this vote does not change the law in Northern Ireland, but it is expected to send a strong signal to Westminster. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, that's right. So it is encouraging, but it doesn't actually hold any legal weight. The UK Parliament will vote later this month as to whether or not it agrees or disagrees with these regulations. But I want to give some more context as to why we're seeing this abortion debate in this region of the world. You know, for a long time, Ireland was this bright light, this beacon for the pro-life movement. They were the leaders when it came to maternal health, and that was largely because of its Eighth Amendment, which upheld and protected the right to life for both the mother and the child. But in 2018, Ireland voted to repeal that amendment, and ever since then, we've seen this aggressive abortion agenda being pushed into Ireland and now into its neighbor in Northern Ireland. I know uh, this de abortion debate that is in response to disability activist Heidi Crowder's appeal for those who may not be familiar with her. Can you talk a little bit more about her and what exactly is going on in the UK? That's right. This is a really important case, and I've had the opportunity to speak with Heidi's lawyer and even a disabilities group that she's working with. Heidi Crowder is this 24-year-old UK woman with Down syndrome, and she is suing over UK's abortion law because over there, there is a 24-week limit when it comes to abortion but not for babies with disabilities. So Heidi Crowder, who is a woman with Down syndrome, is suing over this, saying that hey, this is discrimination. These babies who have Down syndrome like me are being aborted and being treated differently. So this is a landmark case that we will closely be watching because it can have major repercussions for babies who have disabilities, including babies even with cleft lip. What about here in the U.S., Catherine? What's on your radar? Well, all eyes are on the U.S. Supreme Court right now. There are two cases in particularly that are closely tied to the pro-life movement. There's June Medical Services and the Little Sisters of the Poor, which I know you've been reporting on as well. With June Medical Services, the high court needs to decide whether or not Louisiana abortion facilities must uphold the same safety and health standards as other surgical centers in the state. And with the Little Sisters of the Poor, they're back at the Supreme Court yet again. The high court needs to decide whether or not this Catholic order of nuns who serve the elderly poor must violate their conscience over the Obamacare contraceptive mandate. Uh, the high court issues their opinions and rulings Monday mornings in June. And because they haven't come out yet, it's looking like the rest of June is going to be a very busy pro-life news month. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for your time. Great to have you on. God bless you. God bless. Thanks, Tracy. And a reminder that you can watch EWTN Pro-Life Weekly Thursdays at 10 p.m. And for other airing times, visit EWTN.com. And finally tonight, Pope Francis says wrestling with God is a metaphor for prayer. Lottare con Dio. Una metáfora de la preghiera. 
At his weekly talk to pilgrims at the Vatican, the Holy Father says there will be frustrations on our journey in life, but moments of sin and weakness are a chance to pray with a humble heart and to ask for help. Pope Francis also calls prayer a triumph of faith and perseverance. We thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. We're back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night and God bless.